I've got no doubt, you know, obviously playing for England and the Lions, you know, just a big tick in terms of my knowledge of the game. But the, the real thing that helped me was my business career. Hello and welcome back to 40 Minute Mentor, your pocket size career mentor. In today's replay episode, we're revisiting one of my personal favorites. 2023 may not have been the best year to be an England rugby fan, but given that we almost made it to the final of the Rugby World Cup, I thought it was a fantastic opportunity to replay our episode with Sir Clive Woodward, the first English rugby coach to win a Rugby World Cup in 2003. I've been a rugby nut since I was little. I have such strong memories of that 2003 World Cup and I'm sure many of you listening do as well. So for any rugby fan out there who is interested in learning about how Clive led England to victory in 2003 with all of those incredible legends like Johnny Wilkinson, then this will be a real eye-opener for you. But also if you're not a rugby fan, this episode is also packed with amazing leadership advice, lessons on resilience, and also some incredible mentorship if you're looking to hire and build a high-performing team or culture. Clive was an absolute joy to interview and a really, really nice bloke. So without further ado, here is the full episode. I really hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So Clive, welcome to the 40 Minute Mentor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, James. Pleasure to be here. Good stuff. Well, we always like to start the podcast with a quick far round to get a bit of a snapshot of your CV. So if you don't mind finishing these sentences, that would be great. So first up, when I was little, I always wanted to be? A professional footballer. I, I love football, still love football. Got four season tickets at Chelsea, hence the blue top. <laughs> um, but yeah, always, always want to be a footballer and still love football. Fantastic. I'm a Villa fan, so uh, not having as good a season as Chelsea, but uh, that's good to know. My first job was? My first job was as, as a student in my holidays, working in the, the Cowley Car Factory, sp uh, spraying car parts, which was the most horrendous job you could ever do. And they gave it to the, gave it to students. But my first full-time job properly was with Rank Xerox. I was very lucky that uh, after university, I got a uh, uh, as kind of a, um, a, a trainee, a management trainee appointment with with, with Rank Xerox. So that was my first full time job, and I, I worked there for eight, eight years. And they were a fantastic company to work for, and or including five in Australia, where I was a sales director based out of Sydney. So Xerox was my first proper job. Brilliant. My my uncle, I think, spent twenty years at Xerox. So I know I know what a great company it is. And when starting uh, my career, I wish I'd have known. I wish I just captured everything. You know, I, I think. Looking back now, you, you do so much learning in all aspects of your life, but especially in sports and business. If I'd just written everything down and captured everything, that would be priceless information. And I, and I think today we do it a lot better because of technology. But in people kind of my age, we weren't used to kind of just keeping things. And I just wish I'd kept everything, you know, all the learnings from great players, great coaches, great business people. So I just written, written them all down because because they're they're priceless, you know, and you, but you think you can remember everything, but often you can't. You kind of forget these things as you get older. Yeah, that's that's a great one. I'm I'm most energized when I'm. I just learning, you know. I've 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 always had a passion for learning. You know, I'm a fully qualified. My, my degree was in sports science. I'm a qualified teacher. So learning and teaching and coaching was always part of my DNA, and that's where I'm most energized, especially learning something new or, you know, there's nothing I can think of better than if I find something that I think gives us an edge. That someone who we're competing with is not thought of. That to me is kind of wow, groundbreaking stuff. So just learning is is my key thing that energizes me most. Brilliant. Both my parents are teachers, and there's definitely that, that philosophy in our family as well. So that that really resonates. And finally, Clive, can you share something we wouldn't learn from your CV, whether that's a perceived failure or a setback in your career that you've really learned from? Yeah, I think that the the biggest thing that doesn't come out in a CV is. My whole experience is you know, your, your CV, your career doesn't go in a straight line. You know, you, you've had fantastic success and wins, but on the way you've had fantastic failures and you, you never normally see that. And I, I, when I'm interviewing people, I always try to find where they failed. And it sounds a bit bizarre, but I like people who failed because I think I like to see they fail and they bounce back, fail and bounce back. And, you know, no one wants to fail, but it doesn't happen in a straight line. I'd very rarely see anyone do like this. And so people put in their CVs, all the positive stuff, but it's actually putting in stuff, all the all the stuff where you've actually learned. And setbacks are, you don't like them at the time, but setbacks can be really good in developing skills and people. 
Definitely. No, thank you. I think building the resilience from failures is, is so important. And that's something we certainly look for when we interview executives for the roles we recruit. Thanks so much for that, Clive. Really can't wait to dig into your career story. And, and I know you've had a highly decorated career, but I wanted to talk a bit about your earlier sort of part of life, because I know you played rugby for England, earning 21 caps in the 80s when it was an amateur sport, but you also ran your own business. So I'd love to d- explore a little bit, because I think when rugby went professional, professional in the 90s, you became England's first full-time coach. So what were the transferable skills between business and rugby, which helped that transition be easier? Yeah, I think it's important everyone understands, and people forget this, I, I was the first full-time professional coach. The game went professional in 1996, and I was given the, the, off the job as the first-time professional coach. But before that, I had sort of 16 years in, in, the, in the business world. You know, I had eight years working for Xerox, ranked Xerox when I left university which was fantastic. You know, I was a graduate trainee. So you went through all the sales skills, management skills, leadership skills. They were a great training company. I also worked for them in, in Sydney for five years. I was a sales director based out of Sydney. So we, we went there and, you know, Sydney's a pretty special place for me because I worked for Xerox there for five years, got married there. First two kids were born there. Won a World Cup there. So Sydney's a pretty magic, magic place for me. So, so I had eight years building this career within Xerox. Then when we came back from Australia... You know, I was still working with Xerox, but I, I then set up my own small leasing and finance company based on the skills I learned with Xerox Finance. And when I say small, James, it was like 10 people. You know, so I started literally in the back room, my bedroom, like most people start their small business from. Grew it to 10 people, and I, th- and I ran that for eight, eight years. And I, I, says, and I say small, so and that, that was such a great learning for me because you know, working with Xerox was fantastic and big corporate culture and all that sort of stuff. But the, the real... You know, my, my CV was really based on, on that, running my own small company and the learnings for, for that. And then the game went professional and for whatever reason, I got off the, the, the first full-time job of the rugby team. And then what was very, very clear that, you know, I took the skills from running my small company into running the rugby team. And, and, and people often say to me, James, you know, sport is different than business. It's not. You know, it's running the, running the rugby team. It's just like me running my leasing company or working at Xerox. You know, and my favorite line is, you know, business is about delivering results through people. So if you think that you're delivering results through people, if you're running a rugby team trying to win a World Cup, you're delivering results through people. This, it's a business. It's, it's, a, it's a product. So there's no difference. The skill set is the same. But I think having that, that 16 years in business really set me up really well for coaching the rugby team because you, the, it, it, it isn't easy. You, you, it, you have good times and setbacks. You, you do good things well. You make mistakes and all this, all this sort of stuff. But I've got no doubt, you know, obviously playing for England and the Lions, you know, just a big tick in terms of my knowledge of the game. But the, the real thing that helped me was my business career. And because I could come in, start to manage players, make tough decisions, all the stuff you do in business, there, there's no difference at all. And I think no one, no one actually knows that because they, they kind of think, you know, and you see today sometimes, you know, really great players go into coaching and fail badly. And I think they failed badly because they just haven't had that experience in terms of handling people, handling the whole stress of the job. And I loved it. I mean, it was the best thing ever happened to me, the game going professional, getting that job. But I just came with all this kind of stuff behind me. that I don't, No one knew me that well. I was just a player. I was coaching the England on 21 team. But the, And I ran like a business. I just threw the kitchen sink at it and it was like running my own business and I loved it. Fantastic. And as somebody that owns an eight person business, like I, you know, for the last eight years, you, you, you really do learn so much. I mean, good and bad, you know, with something so small, but, but it, I can see how that really translated to, to your coaching career. No, that's awesome. And, and if it had remained amateur rugby, uh, an amateur sport, do you think you'd have stayed in your business? What do you reckon you'd be doing now? Oh, I want to say stay in my business. Yeah, I would have stayed in business. I often say, I've got three, three kids, James, and I've often said to the kids, you know, I've never planned my career. I've never sat down and sort of planned what's going to happen. I've just been lucky that my career has gone, it's strange, almost in eight-year blocks, you know, eight years at Xerox, eight years running so, uh, my own leasing company, then eight years coaching in, in, in England. If I, if I'm not, if it would be stayed amateur, I would have stayed in business. But the business may have changed, may have got something else, may have happened. But, you know, you, you just, I, I think the, the, the secret is just if an opportunity comes, you know, I, I do like to say the grass is not always greener. Just because an opportunity doesn't mean you've got to take it. But I've always been kind of looking back now on my career, and I'm still working now, so I'm not sort of not hanging my boots up if that's the right thing. You know, I'm still very busy now in business and sport. But, you, you know, it's, it's just a case of seeing the opportunities. And if the opportunity's there, go for it. 
I mean, taking the rugby job is a huge risk because it's interesting in, in, le- in leasing and finance, the thing you're, you're taught about, and, we, and when I say leasing, we're kind of a, you know, you're, you're lending money, basically, small ticket loans. The other thing you learn is never never lend to anybody who's been going to, in business less than three years. There's a, there's a big cutoff rate. If you make three years, and how yeah. long have you been going, how long, James? Eight, eight years now, eight and a half years. Well done, big tick, big tick. <laughs> Get past that three-year period, lend them money. If they're less than three years old, keep well away because all the mistakes happen in the first three years. So when I got offered the England rugby job, all my nature was going, don't take it because you're the first one in. It's a new business. You're starting from scratch. Come in in three years' time. Let someone else come in and make all the mistakes and problems, <laughs> have all the fun. Uh, so I didn't do that. So I went against my kind of business in- <laughs> instinct. Obviously, obviously took the actual job. But that you know, I, I just you know, I I just think that the business side is hugely important because it's the same thing. Running a rugby team, running a sports team is a business. You're delivering results through people. Full stop. That's yeah, it. that's uh, and I, I and it would be remiss of us not to talk about you know the highlight of your career. I assume winning the World Cup in two thousand and three, taking England to the top side in the world. Can you tell our listeners a bit about some of the challenges you had to overcome though in in your bid to create that? culture and winning mentality needed to win a world cup because it you know it, it, it certainly doesn't happen overnight no it doesn't happen overnight i mean the, the most important thing is and just to go back to the initial question yeah 2003 winning the world cup was was pretty special but probably even more special was was two things one we, we got to be a number one ranked team in the world which we did about a year before the world cup and that that doesn't happen overnight that's a whole you know three or four years series of matches for england to become the number one ranked team in the world we've never done that in our whole career ever ever that was huge. And there was one special night just before the World Cup. We, we went down and play in New Zealand. And we, we played New Zealand about four or five months before the World Cup. And we won in Wellington. And no English team done that before. To, to actually take an English team and go to New Zealand and win in Wellington was just... If you said that to me six years ago, everyone laughed at you. There's no way England can go to New Zealand and win. And also win well. And also and almost shot the whole of New Zealand. And that was probably the best night of my life because after that game, we went to uh, all the players went back to do all their rehab and all that stuff. But I took all my kind of team, my kind of you know the, the, the coaches, the doctors, all my team. There's about twelve of us. We ended up in this pub in Wellington called the, the Hummingbird, and literally then we played in the kickoff. We walked into this pub. It's kind of packed with all black supporters. Of course, I'm like public enemy number one in the Yeah, game. I was going to say that. That must have been the deadly public, silent. <laughs> the whole pub went quiet, it did. It was oh. went total quiet. Wow. And I've just gone, we shouldn't have done this. We're going to be a fight here. It's going to all kick off. Suddenly there's a round of applause. There was a massive round of applause. And the, the manager, the, the, the bar owner came round and sort of put his arm around me and said, I'm so pleased you come to my pub. You know, the drinks were drinks on us and well done. Wow. And we literally had a lock in that night. And that was just the funniest night of my life. The ultimate was, sign of respect. I, lo- I love that. The, the ultimate sign of respect. And the, but the Kiwi fans were awesome, oh. you know, because they knew we weren't lucky. We, we had a good team. That's amazing. But I thought it was going to be a big, big fight. So that'd be even more so. If I had to go back to one night, that was probably <laughs> more special in 2003. Brilliant. Love uh, that. Thank you, Christian. In terms of... Yeah, I mean, you, you deliver results through people. And, and I was lucky because, you know, I was the first person in. I was the first full-time professional coach. So I literally, James, had the blank bit of paper. You know, it really was start from scratch. And and I just threw everything at it. And the, the key thing was taking the players with you. And and that's not as easy as it sounds because, you know, I had an amazing team in terms of, you know, people came and go. But if you look at Martin Johnson, Johnny Wilkinson, Lawrence DeLang, we had an incredible team of people. But, you know, I think they'd be the first to say they weren't easy because they were so talented, so gifted. These weren't yes men. So I had to take them with me on, on this kind of journey about what we're trying to do. And I had to try and persuade them that we had the ability to become the best team in the world. And that was what we had to do. We had the ability to win the World Cup. You got a very short lifetime at it because it, you, you when you're playing for England, you think it's going to last forever. And you suddenly realise when it's over, it's gone very, very quickly. And all I had to get through to them, and this is where people like Martin Johnson were brilliant, that, you know, the, the amount of time I'm with you during the working day is very small, you know, very small indeed. So you have to become the best individual player you can actually be by what you do 24 7 three, three, six, five. You know, one of my favorite sayings, James, and I remember saying this to players, you know, great teams made of great individuals, which kind of throws people because if you're talking to, I guess, people like myself who are sort of best known for running teams, you think there's some magic formula to teamwork. Well, there's not. The magic formula, and it is a magic formula, if you get every individual 
you know, playing at their absolute best or, or, or becoming the, the very best in their position, the team stuff becomes a lot easier to actually do. So though I'm a team coach in business and sport, I very much look at the individual. So if I was in charge of you, James, my role was to make you the best at what you actually do. And then we work together. How are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? So, you, you know, you're trying to make individual players, fant- just world-class players. And then if you look around the changing room one day, you look at the changing room and go, wow, we've got sort of seven or eight of the best players in the world here. Four or five are probably second best players in the world in their position. Team stuff becomes a lot easier to actually do. So we went on a massive journey about upskilling every individual player. You know, that's where the people at Twickenham, the RFU, was, was so good for me because it took some money. But we started to hire top people in terms of the coaches, top people in terms of fitness and nutrition, all these guys. It took a whole, whole new level. And, but the players had to, had to buy into this. They had to say, we we're actually part of this. And that's what happened. We, had, we, we created this amazing team. But I, I say this to anyone in business, your job as the leader is to make everybody in that team on a daily basis. How can we get better? How can we get better? Well, how can you get better? And if I improve you, James, my experience is you'll never forget that. If I, and you, only you will know. You, you can't kind of pull the wheels over your eyes. But if you generally help somebody, they won't forget you. So my role is trying to help every individual player to become a world-class player. And then the team stuff takes care of itself in many ways. It's brilliant. And it's it's so interesting because Will Greenwood came on this podcast and he, when I asked him for s- some advice, he, he just said, try and make every day just a little bit better. Just try and improve on something every day. So that's clearly really, really ingrained with that crop. You mentioned the big characters you had in the squad. I mean, very, very well, well known, hugely talented, but balancing different personalities, quite big egos in a team is always difficult. So what advice do you have for anyone listening to this that may have that type of team dynamic at the moment? How did you cope with that? Well, I loved it. I mean, it'd be very clear. And, and again, I'm trying to put this, when I keep sport and business are the same thing. I'd always hire the most talented player. You know, I want the most talented player. But then that's like stage one. Once you've got them in the room, it's then how you manage that talent. Because sometimes they're not the most straightforward people. Sometimes what I've found, the most talented people can be, you know, awkward, mavericks, various names have these players. But they're the people who want in your actual team. And again, there's no there's no shortcut to this. The only way to manage them is, is a one-on-one basis. You know, and I'd sit down with the players. I probably had, I'd like to think I had more one-on-one meetings with players than any other coach I know. But I, what I was trying to get through to them is my job is to make you a better player. You know, and what I found with all these different characteristics and egos, whatever, End of the day, every one of them wants to be successful, wants to win. And what I'm saying to them, this got to be a two-way thing. I'm going to give everything to you and plus, but I need it back from you in return. And if any stage I don't, th- I don't think I'm getting it, there's going to be a fallout. And, you know, that way you, you kind of lose some people on the way, but that's all part of, of it. Sometimes people don't want to do that. But the real winners, and I've main, named a few of them already, they, they want this. What I was able to say to them, because I, I played for England and, you know, in, in the, when I played for England, I played 21 times, which doesn't sound very many caps today, but that was over four years. We didn't play the many games in those days. We didn't have, you know, it was just the Six Nations. And what I got through to them, you know, this is just look around the room. We've got a chance here. You know, we started off number six in the world. But look around the play. If we do this, you'll never, ever forget this, ever. And we got to do something special. But every single person's got to actually get involved in this. And that's why I find, you know, different characters. And, and the great thing about it is understanding that's why you know, I say great teams are great individuals. Every character is different. Just to stand in front of a team of people are going to do this, this, and this. That doesn't work. You've got to break it down one by one and then have your team meetings so they all know what's going on. But also ask them, you know, I've got, I've got no problem you questioning what I'm doing, but do not go outside this room and then say, this is rubbish. If it's rubbish, tell me to my face. Yeah. And we're going to get on this. And, you know, it, you kind of win a World Cup and everyone thinks this is incredibly perfect scenario. <laughs> it's not. Yeah, that's not the real world. It kicked off at times, big time. I'm sure it did. Quite feisty because they all got quite. They wanted to win. If someone did something daft in a game and we kind of reviewed it, it would kind of things were pointing and yeah, cool, calm down. But that's what you wanted, and you created this yeah. environment. But I wanted them to be individuals, and I think I think they are. And you you spoke about Will Greenwood, who was just fantastic. But we had this incredibly bright team. Yeah, look at what these guys have all gone on to do now. Without exception, they're all been successful. So this wasn't a bunch of yes people sitting around nodding when I spoke. It was the complete opposite. Yeah, and that's no. what I wanted to actually encourage. I wanted to encourage debate, disagreement, you know, and one of my favorites saying there's no such thing as a daft idea. If you've got an idea, you stand up and say it. And let me decide whether it's a daft idea. And at times we had some pretty interesting team meetings. It all kicked off at times, but 
which I loved. And I said, but I don't care about this in the team room. As long as we all walk out of that room holding hands, smiling with everyone, everything's great. The team room was quite a sometimes hostile place because we wanted to win. And we questioned each other. We weren't doing this stuff. That's brilliant. And and you can see just the encouraging that candor and empowering the team to have their own ideas, but then all being unified by that mission. You can see how powerful that can be. There's a, a saying out there, it's a bit of a sort of a, a technical term. It's called psychological safety. All, all, the, all psychological safety means is, is trying to make sure within your business, people feel safe in terms of putting forward new ideas, new, 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 new thoughts. And in, even in the rugby team, it's amazing. Sometimes people felt a little bit intimidated because they didn't want to make a fool of themselves or they didn't want to question a senior player. Or you may have an 18-year-old player join you. When Johnny Wilkinson joined the team, he was 17. Wow. Couldn't get a word out of him. <laughs> he talked to him now. And I just felt so intimidated by looking across the table. There's Martin Johnson sitting there, Lawrence Delalio. Yeah, that's unsurprising. Little, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did as well. But, no, but, but you've got to get through all that. And you've got to create a psychological safety means an, an area where people totally feel confident they can put forth their views and they don't sit there and hold things back. And that's key to running a successful business or team creating that uh, the environment that people feel safe in making these comments and views. That's brilliant advice. And I'm sure there'll be lots of li- leaders listening to this, trying to and wanting to take that into their businesses. One of the things that you've done expertly over the years is, is deal with pressure. You know, the, the pressure of you know winning a Grand Slam, winning a World Cup and all the, I know the country was behind you, but, but the, every sort of stage you went through, the pressure would have ramped up even more. For any of the leaders and founders and entrepreneurs listening to this, what advice do you have for, for dealing with that sort of pressure? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think pressure is a great word. You know, I think pressure sets people apart. I mean, let's face it, anyone can do it. It's whether it's in sport or business, if there's no pressure. You know, if you've got that 10-foot putt on a Saturday morning with your mates on a game of golf, there's not a lot of pressure on that. When you've got a 10-foot putt to win the Masters, there's a lot of pressure. So pressure is it sets people apart. And I love the word pressure. I, I think I think champion people thrive under pressure. But I don't think, James, pressure is something you're born with. There's no pressure gene in you. I think something you can teach people and you, you can learn how to think about this. And I, I learned this, again, just through sheer luck. I mean, a lot of my life's been just luck. But uh, I met this guy called Yudar Shania. And I, I met him. I won't explain how I met him, but I met him just sheer luck. And you, Yudar was uh, a pilot in the Israeli Armed Forces. He'd, he'd recently... I was still working with them, but he stepped down. It was more in a training view and a learning view. And I heard about this guy, and he was talking about, about winning and about handling pressure and all this sort of stuff. So to cut a long story short, I got hold of him, and literally within days, I'm on a plane to Tel Aviv to meet him. And it was just amazing. And I'd never met him before, but this is me. You know, this is, I often say to people, I'd, you know, I'd fly anywhere in the world if it meant the slightest chance of learning something. So literally outside of my wife, no one even knew I'd gone. I just forgot his plane <laughs> to meet this guy, and he he checked up on me. And of course, in Israel, Israel, they never heard of rugby. You know, the never never heard of rugby, but he checked up on this. And we just started talking about pressure, and he had this this saying because this is what he teaches people. And he had this thing called seat up, which was C T U P. I can see it because I stayed at his house with him, and we literally locked ourselves in a room for a couple of days. And his seat up was correctly thinking under pressure. So just think about C-T-U-P, correctly thinking under pressure. And the key word he kept saying was correctly. You know, it's, it's can you make that right decision when you're under pressure? So I'm looking at this on the board, and I'll never forget this. I said to him, I stood up and said, if we change it around again, we can call it teacup, <laughs> which, is very which is thinking correctly under pressure. Love well, so he went nuts and said, you can't do that with my name. <laughs> so we can't call it teacup, we're going to call it teacup. So teacup very is English how you as well. <laughs> very English. With my teacup. So teacup is how you handle pressure. T, so thinking correctly under pressure. And basically, I'm going to give you a quick, quick example of what we did with the rugby team. And you can relate this to any, any business, but in any meeting, whether it's a one on one meeting or as a team meeting, I'd always have three things available a clock, a scoreboard, and a whiteboard. So imagine a team room. On the board here, I'd have a big clock, a scoreboard, and a whiteboard. In any meeting, I just stop the meeting. So I'd, I'd just stop the meeting and I'd put up a situation. So just imagine the scoreboard. England 12, Australia 16. Clock, five minutes to go. Then on the board, I'd set up a situation. So here's a real-life situation. There's five minutes to go in the game. We're four points down. This is the situation. And I just choose a player in the room. So what would you do? What would you do? That player immediately got to stand up and say to me, 
this is what we'd do. And then quite simply, we wouldn't leave the room until we all agreed that is what we'd do in that situation. And sometimes at disagreements. And then we started to just log all these what I call teacup moments. And the, and the whole takeaway from this, this is what I learned from you, Dar. If you come across something uh, that you call pressure that you've never experienced before, but most important, you've not talked through what would we do in that, in that situation, the chances of thinking correctly under pressure are really small. All these horrendous words kick in, choke, freeze, bottle, rabbits in the headline. Firstly, if you come across situations that you've experienced before, but equally importantly, you've thought through, in like in that situation, this is what we'll do. Backed up by the most sophisticated data, there's a there's a very serious chance that you will think correctly under pressure and make the right decisions. So it's quite simple. You've got to keep logging these, logging these, logging these, and you just keep the whole thing. And you, that's how you do it. So think about what's going on now with, with COVID. M- massive teacup. How do you think correctly under pressure? Will we ready for this? No. Will we planning for this? But even when it's happening, can you still think correctly under pressure and get make all the right decisions as, as it goes along? Yeah, I mean, so many fantastic learnings there for anyone listening. Thank you. I know that that you talk a lot about sport and business, the, the transferable learnings that can be shared between them. Um, and there are many people that were listening to this who who want to emulate the leadership styles and methods that you will have used to nurture talent. So for anyone that's looking to build these high-performing teams that you have, are, are there any particular pieces of advice you think would, that are absolutely critical to, to building high-performing teams? Yeah, I mean, the, the number one thing, and I, I don't, again, I don't know where I get this this from, but I use a thing called 3D learning. Um, and I've never, I don't even know where I got it from, but I've, I've used it forever. And what 3D learning is, is basically, and I'll explain what it is, it's, it's basically when you're approaching any task or situation, I use 3D learning. So the first D is what I call discover. So if you've got a, if you've got a problem or an issue, discover what that means is try and find out as much information you can about it get it out of your head let's, let's talk about rugby let's talk about defending from scrums okay so here's here's our here's our, here's our subject defending from scrums but any subject any subject you can think of growing your lawn properly out the back garden just there's your subject matter so discover so the first thing you do is go to find as much information as you can about this as much as you can from any source you can so get all this information which is di- discover the second d in 3d learning is distill so once you've got all this information, try and distill it down into just a few key points and what I call a checklist. So out of all this information, these are the, the five key points. And in, in my kind of sporting language, does it make the boat go faster? If this, these are key, So out of all this stuff on Discover, what are the key points? What are we trying to learn? So you maybe at most have four or five key points. And then the third D in 3D learning is do. Once we know our key points, how do we do it better? How do we practice it? How do we train for it? So you can apply that to anything discover distill do and this checklist is everything and the, and then you can weight your key points so you, number one maybe weighted heavier than number two or three or four or five but not not a whole list like this maybe just four or five points but what you're saying is if we do those four or five points really really well there's a high chance we'll do that task well so i've always defending from from scrum say here's all the information and you're always discovering you never stop learning because they may just change but we just know if we do those four things properly, I think there was only four things, and everyone does their job properly, we'll do it fine. Then most importantly, then do, how do we train for this? How do we practice it? And then you've got to be really great how you do that. So 3D learning to me is, and I haven't a clue where I got this from, but I've always used it. And it's just so simple and straightforward. So any issue, any problem, 3D learning, and the more you get people, your team putting into it, even, even, even better. Brilliant. And more generally speaking, what lessons can the business world learn from professional athletes and vice versa? Just being fit for purpose. What I mean by fit for for purpose is if you're working with athletes, they're clearly physically fit, hopefully mentally fit for purpose. They take this side extremely serious. Within reason, I don't think business is any any different. I want to say fit for purpose. I think when you're going to work, I, I think you've you've got to look the part, you've got to feel the part, and you've got to be the part. So it, it doesn't mean going to the gym every day and, and, and trying to be Usain Bolt or anything. It's just a case of taking care of yourself physically and mentally. I want to say, you know, physically, that that is just watching your, watching your diet properly. Sleep is huge. So Overlooked a lot myth. in the startup world, but it's, 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 it's so it's fundamental. No, but also sleep... There's almost got a bit of an ego to it because I think it was Winston Churchill and Margaret Thatcher almost dined out on the fact they don't need much sleep. 
And so it became quite a neat, I don't need much sleep. Like, you know, so I think that's rubbish. The more sleep you can get within reason, and I'm talking about, you know, seven hours a night for literally an adult business. If you've got seven, seven and a half hours a night, that's pretty good. But you can monitor sleep now. There's also devices, but sleep's good. Just things like a fluid intake, nutrition, water. You're drinking at least two liters of water a day as opposed to loads of tea and coffee. In saying that, I've just finished my third cup of coffee for the day. So I'm not <laughs> example. But no, drink, drink it fluid, your, your diet. And it's not about changing your lifestyle because what I believe in, even with athletes, is you know almost like just lead a pretty, pretty kind of normal life from, say, Monday to Friday. But Friday night, have a few beers, have a nice meal over the weekend, do the same thing, but then get back into working mode. So just getting fit for purpose. And when you think today, there's so much talk, James, about you know mental health and mental well-being. I think that side all starts with the physical side. If you can get yourself in reasonable shape, you know, trying to do five, 6,000 steps a day by going for a good walk. So it's not doing anything crazy. I'm not trying to make you an athlete. But I think the business world can learn a lot. And Some good I, habits I think there, yeah. It's good habits. But when you're presenting, you've got to look the part. That's the first impression. You've got to look the part. And you, you, you know what I'm trying to say. I, and I just think it's for girls, boys, males, females. Just being being an athlete is is a thing you should think about. And but you're not trying to make you a gym junkie here. I'm not trying to do that. Some simple habits. Yeah, habits. I think that's it, isn't it? And I think one of the other things I we've hired a, a chap called Luke who played for Quinns. Sadly, had a career ending injury in his early twenties, and he came to work for us. And one of the things that I've noticed from sports people is his ability to take on feedback and action. It is something that I, I noticed from sport, and, and you've alluded to that just empowering the team but also giving very clear direction and i think that's something that i've noticed from the sporting world that, that is really really beneficial in business if you can take things on and have that learning mindset but, but just think what i said about 3d learning that 3d learning to discover that wasn't just me in fact it wasn't me I, it was all the players putting in all the information all the stuff they thought their knowledge so you think of the team room we'd had probably 30 people in that team room 30 odd players usually from 12 different clubs the knowledge is huge what, I'm, what we're going to do is put it all in there and then what we're trying to find, okay, of all that discover stuff, what are the key points? And then you want the whole team to agree these four key points. So yeah, that may be different the way you actually play or what you do, but do you agree with this? Then once we get those key points, bang, away we go. How do we do it? How do we practice all those all those to make them world class? And it, and it becomes very, very simple. And it's just using 3D learning, but you want everybody involved. And that's why I think the secret is here. Great teams made of great individuals. I need you contributing, making yourself an individual great player, but I need you contributing to the team, the thought, the knowledge, put it in, not sitting there folding your arms going, well, you, you know, I'll play you, your coach. That's so unreal. That just doesn't work anymore. I'm sure there's going to be lots of people listening to this, writing down 3D learning, getting it into their uh, their business on Monday. So thank you for sharing that, Clive. And I wanted to, you've achieved so much in your career across different industries, but always been you know, very high performing. How do you stay motivated now? Where does that drive come from? Because I know you're still incredibly busy. I kind of just been lucky in many ways, you know, and I, I, I kind of say this to my kids, especially, I've, I've, I've always been lucky. I've never, I can honestly say, and I think I can say this totally honestly, I've, I've never woke up in the morning and go, I'm going to work today. I just do do what I do. You know, I, I loved working at Xerox, a big multinational. I love my own small company especially. And that just, I just love getting up and doing things. But I always like to be learning. You know, today, just in sports, you know, I do a lot of work with the media now in, in, in rugby, but I, I'm running various businesses. But I'm the director of sport of a ski academy in the south of France called, called Apex 2100. I'm also doing a bit of coaching with a couple of golfers. But these at the top level, this is trying to be the best golfer in the world, trying to be Olympic champions at skiing. So we're just applying all my knowledge to these new areas. And I think with, without changing too often, and I've said my, my career's done eight-year eight chunks, the ski academy is awesome but because it's not just a ski It's a full-time ski academy. You go there like to a boarding school. But with international, we've got kids from all around the world. So you look in the classroom, you know, and the split, you know, really clean on the diversity side. So we split 50 boys girls but just learning from the nationalities and seeing these kids all learning from each other you know 13 14 year olds and that they're there because they're great skiers this is they're not there because well, i can afford to pay they're there because we think they can be olympic champions and to try and get them you know down the slope first is is really challenging that's great um, that sounds fantastic you know, so it's a business delivering results for people it's the same thing that i'm doing there which is hugely excited so 
you know, I've, as I say, the, the, the moment I wake up one day and say, oh, I've got to go to work today, I'll probably, okay, it's now the time to put your feet up. As you say, I'm busy than ever now, and I'm you know, living a really exciting life again. That's great that you, you still have the passion for all these different things. And, and I, I wanted to quickly, before we get on to our wrap-up question, just, just mention Hive Learning, because uh, uh, elite athletes can tangibly improve every single day. How do elite entrepreneurs or, or business executives listening to this adopt that? culture of continuous improvement into their own careers on a day-to-day basis because i know hive learning does some stuff around this yeah hive learning is a company i set up in you know as the director of sport for team gb for three olympic games for beijing and vancouver and obviously london 2012 then after london 2012 i set this company called hive learning and basically what hive learning simply is the 3d learning model put on you know is put on this thing here so it's an app it's on it's on here but it, when you think about it, it, it what, what, it's, what it is, is it's allowing people what we call peer-to-peer learning. So what I basically saw the rugby team, I'm, I'm here, 30-odd players, all the coaches, we all learned together in the room. All we did was digitize that, that process. And what I learned at the Olympics was when I went around all these amazing sports, you know, including British cycling, sitting in the back of the room, actually what we did the rugby team was quite unique. I thought everyone did this. So we developed this app around this. And now, you know, Hive Learning is going really, really well. We're really proud of it. It's We're obviously working in sport, but 95% of the business is business. Big companies using it. And what, we'd, what we're trying to encourage is this learning on a day-to-day basis. That, but you learn from each other. So it's peer-to-peer learning through, through the actual app. And I think this, this is the key to it. And as, as I keep trying to say, I, I always pride myself on, on not being good at the new ideas. What I pride myself on if I'm leading a team is going, that's a good idea, James. And if that's going to make the boat go faster, we are going to do it. I, my job is to move heaven and earth to make that happen. If that's going to make a difference to the performance of the business or the team, my job is that that's what leadership's about, I think, not coming up with the big ideas and all this sort of stuff or even the small ideas, is getting the engagement of your team. Because the best ideas, in my opinion, have always come from the team. Always. And that's why I still think as a player, although I'm a coach, I still kind of wish I was sitting there as a player. <laughs> and I, Best ideas come from the people on the shop floor. Yeah. The people who are out there on the, doing, you know, if you're talking about defending in rugby, I want to hear from the players doing it, not yeah. some coach who hasn't played for the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. And then you you, you take their view, apply 3D learning, bang, it, it kind of works. And it and, comes and back that's, to that's, that psychological safety. Like you as a coach have created the environment where people feel they can put forward their ideas and share them. So it really ties in nicely. Linked to that, I've got psychological safety and what I call creative abrasion. And what creative abrasion is you're putting forward ideas that you know are going to cause some 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 comments friction. or you are. <laughs> some friction, that's the word. Yeah. Creative abrasion. But that's good. And But the most important thing, if people know you're going to do that, it's, it's not no problem. If part of our rules of engagement, we want everyone talking like this, you know this is coming. I mean, and you're not doing this for the sake of doing it. You're doing it because, no, I don't, I don't agree with that, James. Whoa, I don't agree with that. For the following reason, that's great. It's, so it's having the psychological safety and also understanding in teams of people, creative abrasion is a good, good thing. As long as the big point, when you walk out the door, everyone's holding hands and smiling. So there's nothing wrong with that in the team. That's what winning teams do. And I've seen that in all the big successful businesses and teams I've been involved in, that these team rooms aren't this beautiful, wonderful, perfect place. That's not the real world. And you see that in a small business. When you run a small business, that happens automatically. Because, you know, if you don't get this right, you do lose your house. The kids have got to change schools. The school fees are gone. Yes. And yeah. you, you, get, you get serious about it. I can it's relate serious, to that. <laughs> serious uh, subject. So you've got to be serious about it because you got out of business. Where sometimes big club companies, people kind of get away with things because you, you're you're looked after by the big organization. And the secret of running a, a big company is running, running like a small company. Imagine it was your own business, 10 people. What would you do? How would you do it? Love it. Thank you, Clive. Well, we're sadly at the end. I've got three wrap-up questions, but I've, I've absolutely loved this uh, conversation and I know our listeners will have done too. It would be remiss of me not to talk about mentorship given you are on the 40-minute mentor. So do you have a mentor or mentors? And either way, if you do, I'd love to learn a bit about that. But also, if there was one person in the world that you could be mentored by, who would that be? Okay. In, in terms of mentor, certainly early on, Rugby wise, I was very lucky. I went to Loughborough University. We had a coach there called Jim Greenwood, who unfortunately has passed away now. But Jim was just fantastic. He wrote a book called Total Rugby. It's still a Bible in New Zealand. It's the absolutely go-to book in terms of coaching. And he wrote this 40 odd years ago. 
So Jim was definitely my mentor as a player and a coach in terms of what we actually did. And that was, I'll never, I'll never forget that. He was just fun. He was light years ahead of his time. His book now is still, whatever. In, in terms of, sort of currently, I, I can honestly say no, but what, what I do do is, is this, James, and I, and I love doing this. So I've, I've probably got lots of mentors, really. What I used to like, and I just use, use the rugby team as an example. What I used to do in the rugby team was, was to invite people like you into my world. When I say people like you, James, these are people I know, I'm friendly with, but I, all, I know they're all successful in whatever their jobs are. So, you know, it's, and I'd invite them into the, in the rugby team individually. So we had a couple of hedge fund managers, you know, top chief executives from big PLCs. And of course, if, you, if I'm saying to you, do you want to come and spend a day with me? You, you say, yeah, of course I will. Yeah, definitely. Here's, here's, here's the deal. You can come and spend a day with me, two days with me. We're going to show you everything. We're going to be totally transparent. Sit in the back of the room. Keep out the way. Don't go gaga when Johnny Wilkinson comes in. Just, just keep out the way. But the deal was this. By the time you leave, I want at least one thought or idea of something we could do better. So literally, these were people who were obviously very successful in their world, fans of sport and probably rugby. And, I, and, and over the sort of eight years of coaching England, I would have probably brought in over 30 plus people individually for a couple of days. And I equally promise you, every single one of them left and gave me a bit of paper saying, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Wow. It used to drive brilliant. me nuts. It used to drive me nuts when some <laughs> hedge fund manager, who hadn't played rugby for 40 years since his prep school under eights, would come up with an idea we'd not thought about. And we're supposed to be this high-performing team with all the ideas. Oh, so galling. <laughs> and I said, how about it's taking a hedge fund manager who hasn't played rugby for 40 years? <laughs> oh, this thing. Oh, and then in brilliant. true leadership style, in true leadership style, you sit down with your team and go, listen, I've had this great idea. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, That's it's a sign of a great leader. Yeah, take credit for someone else's idea. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> mentors is a good word. I like mentors. But I think I had lots of them because they, they, they got really close to me, the team, and, and they came up with so many ideas. But seriously, I go, well, how come we've not thought about that? Yeah, and I don't think businesses do that. They send everything closed shop. I think that's and it. I think it's where people can learn from. Yeah, yeah, and it, I, that, that's inspired me. I think there's something to be said for bringing in external eyes and ears and thoughts just yeah. to just to mix things up and give you a different perspective. I, I love that. I promise you, if you ask them nicer, they do it for nothing. They don't charge yeah. you. Yeah, they're more than happy to help if you ask them. Yeah, and especially the sporting team, they loved it. And, and yeah, plus, I can imagine. You know, if I was asked to come in, you know, if Alex Ferguson said to me those years ago come and sit of course you would be yeah. wow because that's where i'd want to be you'd Absolutely. pay to do it i'd pay to go sit in on some of those sessions so <laughs> no that's 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 so interesting and and given all the success you've had clive uh, what do you want to be remembered for at the end of your career uh, i know you still you're still as busy as ever but when you do hang up the boots what do you want to be remembered for oh uh, yeah it's, i mean it's difficult question to answer i mean i, I just hope people anybody who's worked with me in the various things I've done, would, would hope to say they've really enjoyed it. It was it was a fun time, you know, because I do believe in having fun. And fun isn't going down the pub on a Friday night. Fun is throwing the kitchen sink at things and really not being scared of, of making making mistakes. And my, my, my favourite saying is just no if onlys. You know, whatever happens, we're not going to look back in years to come and go, if only we'd done that, if only we'd done that. And, I, you know, there's just no if onlys. If this is going to make the boat go faster, we're going to do it. Doesn't matter who we got upset on the way, what's going to happen, and you do, you know, upset a few people on the way if you got that philosophy. But if you're trying to get to a real goal of winning something special, like that can relate to the rugby term, you got to do that. So just, I just say a no if only culture. But hopefully everybody say, you know, male and female, they they really enjoyed working with me, and they were totally part of the team. They were totally engaged. Inclusive is the word. They were totally inclusive in what we actually did, and. That's what I'd like to think I'd be remembered for. I'm sure that would be the case. And finally, Clive, for any listeners aspiring to become a world-class leader like yourself, what final piece of advice would you leave them with? Oh, just understand, it's not going a straight line, you know. And I must believe if you throw as much energy and passion at something, it will stick and you will get there. But do not worry or not, don't, don't overly worry if there's setbacks on the, on the way. You know, my rugby career with England went from there to there. But on the way, we had huge losses. I mean, we even lost Scotland once. I mean, that stuff happened. (laughs) 
That was a joke, by the way, from my friend Scott. <laughs> I'm going to get lots of people writing in now, Clive. Thanks for that. <laughs> not a good joke, not because no, we got we they smashed in the last time we played the Twitter. But, you know, setbacks are on the way, but you can learn from setbacks. Yeah. You know, yeah. and just and it just gets keep going. And, you know, hard work gets you through most things. But just, and, and the last thing is just be learning. You know, I, I pride myself on studying, reading, learning, and just listening to other people. And I think that's hopefully coming through that, you know, it's not coming from me all the time. I, you've got to listen and learn and, you can learn so much from other other people if you get the right people in the actual room. Definitely. Clive, it's been an absolute joy. Thank you so much for sharing your, your career story and so many brilliant bits of mentorship. We wish you all the very best for all the different things you're doing at the moment and uh, hope in due course we can meet in uh, in person uh, to, to exchange some more stories. But thank you so much for, for being on the pod. All right, James, and good luck to you and your company as well. This is a very, very interesting program you're running, so well done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for tuning back in. I really hope you enjoyed today's 40 Minute Mental episode. And if you're after even more mentorship, then please make sure you look through our podcast archives of over 200 episodes. And if you're enjoying 40 Minute Mentor, we would love to hear why. We read every single review that you leave us. So please consider taking one minute today to head over to ratethispodcast.com forward slash 40mm or your favorite podcast platform to let us know what you're enjoying about the pod. And if you have any feedback on how we can make it even better, please reach out to our head of marketing and 40 Minute Mentor producer, Hannah, on hannah at jbmc.co.uk. We really can't wait to hear from you.